So let's make a start. So the first question really is around choosing your network, the approach to network transformation. So I suppose the first question I've got is, what comes first in, in choosing your approach for transformation? Is it the architecture and product choices, or is it around the service and the management choices you make? So job one is work out which features you need. What, what are you trying to deliver? So depending on your network, you may or may not want security wrapped up inside the SD-WAN VNF. You may be planning on you know, extending your existing firewall supplier. Do you want to do that as a physical box or as a VNF on a UCPE? If you're going UCPE, you're going to need a platform and something to manage that platform. Once you've got all your requirements in place, then you can start thinking about getting an RFP together, building a vendor list, and to a degree that will drive the, the discussion around what your architecture looks like. And from there you can start taking this into the lab, beat the hell out of it with some traffic generators and take it through to, uh, to pilot and roll out. So based on my experience, architecture determines service model underneath because um, it depends on what uh, kind of level uh, with respect to shared services or dedicated bespoke services are involved in a, in a complete service wrap then. And, um, and I think uh, especially when uh, we are in the area of a hybrid environment, legacy infrastructure with transition to the cloud, you know, uh, a heavy traffic lifting from data center to cloud, uh, this, this, this has to be architecture led model. And therefore the architecture from our perspective should determine the service wrap uh, during transition. And it may change once uh, we are in, in future state uh, this could then be uh, adopted accordingly. Most companies, still from what we're seeing here, um, are coming from a position, particularly sort of large legacy global network companies, are coming from a position where they've had an MPLS network. Um, there's the DIY part of the market, and then there's the managed part. The managed part typically is taken global. MPLS networks primarily from single vendor. And from that vendor, you've had your intelligence and your transport, et cetera. Now, as you move to SD-WAN and you look at overlays, you look at multiple underlays, MPLS, DIA, broadband, 5G, um, does this open up your choices for vendor selection? And, and how does the single vendor that brings it all together compare with the, well, actually, I'll choose a load of different areas. And how's that different in, in sort of um, the overlay versus the underlay? Well, we've always been DIY, so our MPLS networks were wires only. We've always held the CE configuration. Mm -hmm. But starting from there, the question was how much appetite for change was there? Uh, our initial plan was to go from dual MPLS to MPLS plus internet with an SD1 overlay. Mm -hmm. We were quite keen on going down the VNF route. Um, and that did, did limit us a little bit, but as the RFP played out, it turned out that it was going to be, in cost terms, pretty much comparable to taking internet or MPLS. So at that point, we could take the, the less risky solution, apply an SD-1 overlay to our existing MPLS, get used to that, and then when the contract's around in 18 months, two years from now, then we can look at MPLS to internet. Mm -hmm. And that gives you, if you're doing it yourself, you do get the broadest range. You, you can pick the overlay product that's absolutely right for you. You either keep your existing underlay or you transform that as well. But you've got the broadest product selection. If you do want to go down the managed route, then you need to find a partner you can trust with a product that you trust, which is, it should be doable in this day and age, but it's not shoo-in. And you'll probably, certainly if you go down the provider route, you'll be tied into their underlay along with, um, with their overlay. So they'll quite happily manage a second provider or internet or whatever on top of that, but you're restricting your choices. I guess you do get to delegate some of the design work. You get to lean on their experience. So. One of the things you do have to choose early on, I think, is your management regime. So are you going with a managed service provider or are you going DIY? In order to do that, I mean, what, what do people think of the key functions that desperately need to be kept in-house and what are the functions where really you think you would benefit from using a sort of a managed solution from someone else? 
you, you, you keep hold of what, what right now you believe are the interesting bits. So yeah. for us, um, we're quite happy getting under the hood of these things. We've got a, a global team of strong support and deployments engineers. So, that, you know, they're perfectly capable of running what's essentially IPsec plus MP BGP with a fancy wrap around it. So um, we're, we're not particularly mm -hmm. scared by taking a lot of it on ourselves. If right now your mm -hmm. uh, network is managed by a third party, then I think you'd be crazy to go full DIY. You, you've got a support and deployment team to build up first. Mm -hmm. So what might make more sense there is to go down the managed route get the managed service provider, whether that's a carrier or an integrator, to build it for you. And then when your contract comes around in three, five years time, that's that's maybe the time to think, am I ready to start running this myself? So a right. lot of the SD-WAN attraction is that centralized management. Sure, you're getting traffic steering, encryption, and all the rest of the great features. But for us, it, it gives us a leg up on uh, NFV and automation that uh, it just proves that we, we can do it and then we'll take that knowledge and we'll extend it horizontally to, uh, to other areas. One of the big value adds from what a managed service provider offers you is the ability to help in the troubleshooting if things go wrong, uh, to be that assistant. Also like software upgrades to manage that for you because mm -hmm. it's not something you actually have to have for the business. What, what should people really be aiming to get from a proof of concept to, to ensure that they have a successful implementation and transformation? So if we're doing a POC, then I'm not expecting massively tailored policies. What I, what I want to do is have a test for every feature that we intend on using mm -hmm. and that the, the vendor inevitably said, yes, we support that in their RFP response. So job one is to prove that out. Job two is to try to do some sort of end-to-end -end test to make sure those features work together. And finally, if you've got any interest in running it yourself, you've absolutely got to take an interest in what's going on. You can't just sit there and watch the results scroll by. You've got to hope something breaks because then you'll be getting in on the command line. You'll find out how it really works and how easy it really is to fix it. There are two types of pokes. First of all, when, when the traffic pattern change is already known. So if, if there's a, an anticipation of a traffic shift from data center to cloud, you know, uh, the policy uh, uh, setting or the testing how policy may be adopted uh, or deployed, this has to be pocked. You know, so that uh, uh, but, uh, I've seen that most of uh, the clients are still using destination-based routing, so we could have, basically question to which extent <laughs> SD1 uh, policies are then uh, being configured. Um, but then on the vendor side, it's also advisable to challenge a bit the vendors on that level because the, regarding the, the density of the SD1 gateway. So if you have internet and MPLS caller, when do you drop in into uh, the MPLS cloud? And there you, you may see some kind of interesting surprises where you see uh, how traffic is floating around the world. So this, uh, this one I would poke in uh, with respect to the latency impact. Mm -hmm. and uh, between uh, overlay and underlay and uh, and uh, and this is something uh, so the traffic pattern uh, analysis has to be done and before that i would uh, pull uh, uh, application demography or statistics for, from um, if there are some kind of acceleration devices in place to pull that kind of data to see what kind of traffic is at all uh, carried over the network and based on that it can be distinguished between the, is this internet color or MPLS color and this mm -hmm. has to be poked take whatever it is you're looking for and try that over a live network you have we had quality issues and so we had some intermittency going on yeah. and so we wanted to see two things we want to see developers being able to check in code and get it out to the cloud yeah. and then we also want to see a, a conference call in the, the uh, in the room next door we wanted to see both of these things occurring at the same time so yeah. when we we knew we could induce poor performance in some of our uh, shoddy locations where the, the coverage was not so hot. Um, and so when we could show with that proof of concept, uh, multiple different vendors, what was going on, what things looked like, and we could prove that quality was better. Then we started looking at monitoring systems, kind of looking underneath, what could we see in that underlay that was kind of a problem? Just the limitation of the number of queues 
on a lot of the underlay. Mm -hmm. That higher level cueing on the overlay and that qualifying on top, being able to see the difference between the two just it, it becomes a, a, a the light gets turned on for all intents and purposes and your network engineers can now fix things quickly and easily.